Our next speaker is Ian Cunliffe. Ian is a public speaking coach and author who provides, as he says, insanely practical advice for Toastmasters to help them <coughs> to take their public speaking public. In his presentation, Crushing Table Topics, Ian will share with you the exact table topics strategies that he used to become a back-to-back -back District 21 Table Topics finalist in 2012 and 2013. Please help me welcome Ian Cunliffe. I'd like to start by sharing a nagging suspicion I have with you. I have a theory. I believe that Toastmasters is an organization that is as insidious as it is congenial. Now I've got a few puzzled faces here. How could Toastmasters be insidious? Congenial, sure. Insidious? But hear me out. I want you to cast your mind back. Let's go way back in the way back time machine to the very first time you walked through that door. You'd never been to a Toastmasters meeting before. You're sitting here on the edge looking in, there's a bunch of people moving around. They all seem to know what's going on, but not you. You're not really sure. Are they going to ask you to attend a religious meeting or a little contact details? There's that odd new room smell. But somebody sees you there looking unsure of yourself, and they say, hey, welcome. Come on in. And they make you feel comfortable. They sit you down with someone nice. If you're at a club like this, you might even get a plate of juice and cookies. And before you know it, you are sipping a glass of Hawaiian fruit punch, munching on a pea green biscuit, watching some poor devil up here flop sweat their way through a session of table topics. And you're thinking to yourself, this is really entertaining. <laughs> Until they call you. <laughs> and, uh, <"Whoa." laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I remember the first time they called me. I felt like a deer in headlights. I got clapped up to the front of the room and my feet took over and I thought, oh, this can't be happening. But sure enough, I wound up right here. And I've been a district finalist four times in the last two years, so you would think I probably was a natural. I probably had one of those table topics where they pitched me a softball and I saw it coming and I limpered up and swung and oh, went over the fence and I went jogging. No. It was a complete and utter trail derailment. Killed all the salmon in the stream and no one could swim in that river for five years. <laughs> I felt like an airbag had gone off in my boat. Oh, my tongue swelled up. Parts of my body that are normally wet started getting dry. Parts of my body that should be dry started getting wet. And eventually you had the decency to clap me off the stage. And I remember getting back to my seat thinking, I will never do that again. <laughs> and that's our introduction to table topics. Then you never see it coming. But here's the good news. They're going to get you to do it again next week. <laughs> and as much as I love Toastmasters, and I, I talk about being insidious in jest, I do want to hit you with a serious consideration. I want you to think about, are we teaching people how to approach table topics in a structured manner, or are we encouraging them to flounder? When I was a kid, that's how we did it with swimming. I learned to swim, my dad would take me down to the local pool and said, ready son, ready for, whoa, and he threw me in. This was the bad old days, okay? <laughs> and I sunk like a stone and I floundered and there were lots of bubbles and eventually an arm came in and pulled me out and I got one piece of advice, kick your legs, kick my legs, kick, whoa, and back and I went. And gradually I learned somehow without quite knowing what's going on to work my way back to the ledge. And I sort of floundered. I'd get thrown into the pool, and then I would flounder my way back without really being conscious of what I was doing and how. And as a result, I could swim. But did I ever feel really comfortable and confident? Did I ever understand my processes that were allowing me to be successful? Because if you don't understand your processes, 
you can't build on them. It becomes a game of chance. It's not, it's luck rather than skill, luck rather than design. So what I want to do today is I want to encourage you to rethink table topics. I'd like to teach you my strategy. Now my strategy is, it's just mine, okay? There are many other strategies for table topics that work really, really well. And there are many people who are better table topic speakers than I am. But what I do, it works. And if you've ever come up here and if you ever have a table topic session and you've been hit with a question that you had no idea how to answer, when you reach into your toolbox as a speaker, isn't it a nice thing to actually have a tool to reach for? So, sorry, I have a pulled muscle and it's just killing me. Um, so, okay, let's think about this here. The first thing we should probably do is acknowledge the regular skills that we use at table topics, things you may have heard of before. There's lots of different strategies, but the truth is most of them come down to what I'm going to call segmentation. We don't know how to fill the two minutes, so we try and break it down into small chunks. Make sense? So you may have heard techniques like, oh, sorry, you may have heard techniques like point-counterpoint. You get asked a question, you're not sure how to answer it. Break it down into two steps. Well, on one hand, some people think this. On the other hand, some people think that. What you did was you took a two minute question and turned it into two one minute questions. And then as you work through those questions, you have the opportunity to decide which answer you like best and that's what you're gonna summarize on, <laughs> okay. And although I kind of make fun of this technique a little bit, people win every year with this at the district level. It's a good technique. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, this is not the only way to segment. There's a lot of other ways. There's one I like to call past, present, future. Past, present, future. When I was a young man, oh, this is how I would have approached that problem. Today, knowing a little bit more and being married, I approach that problem a little bit differently. However, in the future, when all my kids go off to university, and I've got some time on my hands, I will do it this way. I just broke it down into three separate questions. Are there other ways we can break it down? Absolutely, could we break it down by season? Sure, well in the winter, I like to do this. In the spring, I like to do that. In the summer, I like to do something else. So that's how to segment. There's one other good one as well I like, and that's uh, sequential. Does anybody here know Stefano Casalter, our, our district public relations officer? Stefano's a heck of a nice guy, and he recently did just a wonderful table topics question where he, um, he was asked, what would you do if you, um, if you found yourself stranded at the side of the road in the middle of the night and your car had broken down? Now, Stefano knows nothing about car repair, so he started to panic. But then he thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk about panicking. So what he did is he broke it down into steps. What's the first step you do when you panic? Well, first of all, I scream. Secondly, I stumble and lose my cell phone and step on it while I'm looking for it. And he went progressively step by step by step until eventually they found in the morning, naked only covered by a bunch of mud, huddled around a fire he'd made out of a burning tire. Right? <laughs> right? So he broke it down by, by steps. And you can break almost anything down by steps and you can take one small piece of the question that you understand and just break it into pieces. So that's the sequential approach. Now, it's not a bad approach, and people win with this every year. You can do really well with the sequential approach. But there's a reason why I prefer not to use it if possible. And that is just this. Sequential approaches are predictable and they're identifiable. So if judges in your audience see you using count, uh, point counterpoint and they're familiar with the strategy, they recognize it as a strategy. You lose some of your authenticity. So I think it's very, very important as speakers that we realize we're not up here to speak. We are up here to connect. And nothing connects like being sincere and authentic. Have you ever been on the phone when a telemarketer calls? You say, hello. And say, hello, Mr. Connie Lifey. It's Cunliffe. Yes, Mr. Connie Lifey, I would like to tell you I'm not interested. About the great deal. Are they really listening to you? Or are they working off a formulaic script? Right? You might have the same person call you, but actually say, gosh, Mr. Cunliffe, I'm really sorry. Have I caught you at a good time? Well, I've got a minute here, but not much. 
oh, well, you know, I was just wondering, I noticed that you'd bought this product in the past and we had, you know, something that might interest you. Who's more likely to be successful? The person working off the script or the person who is actually making some effort to acknowledge who you are and what you're saying, right? Because the truth is that when we talk to people, we're having a conversation. It's not a one-way conversation either. You should think of it as like tossing a ball. Alan says something thought-provoking, you think. Alan hits you with a joke, you laugh back. It's a give and take, there's an ebb and flow. And table topics is no different. It's impromptu speaking, but it's still speaking. So the degree to which we can create an authentic connection and be real is to the degree to which you are going to crush that table topic. Okay, so how about we get into my technique now? I've told you about the other techniques that many people use very successfully, but this is mine. It does not work all the time. It works about 60% of the time. You will be hit with questions periodically where it will be inappropriate and you will go to a different tool in your toolbox. But when it works, <laughs> it's fun. And I think that you're going to find that you're going to be able to tell really authentic, real stories that are truly unique, that will have your audience really feeling who you are as a speaker. So in order to do this though, I need your buy-in on one thing. I need you to take one thing on faith for me. Can you do that? Thank you. All right, it's simply this. It just, you don't even have to totally buy in. You can just put it on a shelf and say, okay, Ian, we'll hear you out. And then we'll judge for this at the end. We'll judge for ourselves. And it is simply this. There is a myth that's absolutely pervasive amongst Toastmasters. And the myth is this, you know, you cannot prepare for table topics. They can ask you anything. How can you prepare for anything? It's not possible, right? Right. Anyone ever heard some sentiment of that expressed? Right. Well, here's the good news. Although they can ask you anything, anything is a whole lot more manageable than you think. I'm going to teach you how to compartmentalize questions by genre and category. Okay? So if you can buy into that for a moment, I'm going to show you the techniques you can use to exploit the fact that they really can't ask you anything. All right. So the first thing I want to share with you is the best piece of advice anyone ever gave me about table topics. Darren Fru, many of you know Darren, a long time Toastmaster, probably belongs to your club. I think he's up to eight now. When I was a total newbie, first time at district, I'd only been in Toastmasters for five months and I'd stumbled my way into the district finals for humorous and, and for table topics. I had no idea what I was doing there. Utter flop sweat. Darren pulled me in and he said, Ian, shut up and think. <laughs> now, he said it much more nicely than that, but it tells better when I say it that way. But what he said to me was, just because they've said your name, the question, the question your name, doesn't mean that you have to fill the silence. You've got time. You're allowed to stand, collect your thoughts, and think about what you might like to say. But what do most of us do? As soon as we've been introduced and you're standing here, what is your immediate urge? What is that, that one thing that you feel like you have to deal with? Anyone know? You gotta start talking, right? Exactly. You've gotta fill the silence. Got to fill the silence. Oh, the silence is awkward. It's, oh, it's horrible, right? But if any of you have ever seen that movie, The Matrix, with Keanu Reeves, the science fiction movie, it's sort of like time goes at different speeds. If you're like one of the chosen ones, you, bullets sort of appear to go by you slowly, whereas other people are zipping around. Time flows differently when you're up here than when you're over there, okay? Time feels like it's zipping along pretty darn fast when you're up here. But 10 seconds up here to collect your thoughts, 15 seconds up here to collect your thoughts is nothing. Ed Tate, 2000 world champion, uses what I like to call the Ed Tate stare. He knows what he's going to say, but he will often use silence to bring all of your attention on him. If you were playing with your Blackberry, Ed will scan the audience, say nothing, make eye contact around the room to the end, and then he'll work his way back again. And by the time he's done, there is not a peep in the room. Everyone has their attention on Ed. And if it's good enough for Ed Tate, it's probably good enough for all of us, right? So you've got some time on your side. 
Now, let me tell you a little story about me, an anecdote, if you will. In 2009, I had like the best midlife crisis ever, okay? I was 39 years old, I was about to turn 40, and I realized I hadn't fulfilled my potential in life, I had no idea what I was doing, and I thought I was turning into a big ball of lard. And I thought, I gotta do something. And I signed up for the Marathon de Saab, the toughest race on earth, 240 kilometers self-sufficient across the Sahara Desert. Sandstorms, 45 degree temperatures, night traversing over mountains, you name it, I did it. And it was awful. <laughs> there was a point where I was lost for six hours in a sandstorm, and I gotta tell you, that's a pretty scary feeling. I'd managed to get dysentery on the first day, and I hadn't been able to hold food down. So I was going on three days down, and I was working off body fat. I couldn't keep anything in me. And once you hit pure physical exhaustion, and you're not taking any calories, something really funny happens. You no longer need cable because you're hallucinating. <laughs> you get to see great stuff. And I saw a mirage. Now I gotta tell you, the mirage, it looks like that really grainy television from the 1950s, you know, with station identification and all the pixelation, right? But I could see how if you'd been out in the desert for a couple more days without any water, that would look really good and you'd start running off towards it. And I was lost. I got back on course a few hours later, but I was lost and I saw something that looked like people, and it was, but it was people about 1,200 miles away because of light bouncing over the sand. And I could have very easily, in a fit of sponta uh, spontaneity, wanting to, to bridge the, the awkward, don't know what to do, gotta think about this, and just started running in a horrible direction. And how many of you, don't be shy, raise your hand and don't do any of this half raise on me. How many of you have ever chased a mirage, you saw the first idea of a table topics question and you jumped at it only to get 30 seconds in and realized it was nothing but shimmering air? Okay, all right. So I hope I've made a case for you for using that time at your disposal. You've got time. Your audience will think you're distinguished. If you make eye contact with them, <laughs> smile, and get your thoughts together. Go for the best idea, not the first idea. Sound reasonable? Okay, so the next idea that I wanna uh, talk to you about is I want you to think about, no, let me put it differently. I want you to ignore the question. That's so rude, we're table topics people, we're, we're Toastmasters, we don't do that. I want you to ignore the question you're given and I want you to do one thing. I want you to ask yourself, what is the underlying question, okay? Don't get hung up on the precise wording of the question you're given. Ask yourself what's the more universal question being asked. Can I give you an example from my own life? Thank you. I was asked once to tell the audience about my worst day on the golf course. Great, except I don't golf. So that might kind of throw you a little bit, right? You don't golf, how, how are you gonna talk about your worst day on the course if you've never been on a course, right? But if you use my strategy, you realize this isn't really about golf courses, it's about worst days. I bet a few of you may have even had a worst day in the recent past. Maybe it didn't take place on a golf course. But let me ask you this, could you move it there? So I'll give you an example. My wife and I had been trying to adopt for two years, and it was a very, very painful time in our lives. And we thought we were going to adopt a beautiful boy. And it fell through, right? So right now you can pick up the, the emotional pain that I, that I have about that subject. It's, it's very real, right? Now imagine me taking that conversation and just putting it on the fifth, the fifth tee. Right? Instead of getting it in my car where I got it, I moved it over to the fifth tee. Do you think that created a powerful story for my audience? Do you think that they could feel my emotional investment in my answer? Do you think it completely set me in a different category than my competitors? Absolutely. Now, the problem that many of you might be thinking though, and that Alan stole my thunder on, oh, I hate following Alan, is, <laughs> is that, a lot of people go, but Ian, it didn't happen that way, <laughs> right? And, and Alan and I have the same mantra. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Now, I want to hit you with a caveat, though, okay? Because that's like, if I just told you that alone, 
That's like giving a firearm to a toddler, okay? <laughs> this, this, it's going to end badly. So let, let, me, let me qualify it just a little bit for you. What I want you to do is I want you to be truthful, painfully truthful about the core of what you're talking about. If you've never had cancer, don't talk about the time you got diagnosed with cancer because it is such a powerful thing that is reserved only for people who've had that. You know, if you choose to share that story, that's a powerful thing. You will connect with your audience, right? But if you've never had it, never betray your audience's trust. As a speaker, I, this is my opinion, but I think your audience always deserves better, and I, I think that they will know. On some level, many of your audience, audiences are smart. Play to their intelligence, right? So, you know, if it's something important in your life, if you've never lost a child, don't talk about the time you lost a child. But if you want to talk about where your adoption fell through, does it matter if it happened in the parking lot of the Denny's or if it happened uh, in the drive through at McDonald's? No, it does not. If the story tells better because you're wearing flip-flops instead of hiking boots, have you compromised your moral integrity? No, you have not. So I, I'm coming back to the wisdom of Alan here, and Alan's got so much wisdom. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right? We can look at the underlying question, and we can match it to something that we want to talk about that we've got some passion and power for. All right? So once you've... Let, let me just replay this here, because there are a few steps. And by the way, I'm going to give you a chance to get all this in detailed note form. I realize I'm hitting you with a lot of information. I'll tell you where you can download the whole thing as a PDF. Okay? Save the writer's claw. Um, so we know there's a big myth out there that you can't prepare for table topics. Clearly, you can, and we're going to talk about how to do that a little more. We know that we've got more time than we think. We don't have to just start talking. We have 10, 15, 20 seconds, if you're really nervy, right? to organize your thoughts and pick the best answer, not just an answer. We also know that when we hear the question, we should stop and think about what's the underlying question? What's the more universal idea that our table topics master is really asking us to expound upon? All right? And now what I want you to do is something that is so powerful, I wish someone had introduced this to me when I first got started. I want you to think about something I'm going to call your personal narratives. Okay, that's a good one to write down, personal narratives. And I'm going to challenge you to do something. I won't ask you to do it right now, but if you're maybe thinking about table topics, or if you just like a turbo boost for your speech idea file, I want you to build a personal narrative sheet. And it goes something like this. Have a little pad and paper. I sometimes keep one of those ones, ones you can fit in your pocket. And whenever you think of like one of those moments in your life that was powerful, write it down. But you have to do it in one sentence. Not two, not five. Ten words or less. We're not writing an essay. We're just remembering something powerful. And I want you to think about the spectrum of your life. Because really what we're doing when we're answering table topic questions, we're just answering the universal plot types that are common in all fiction and all literature. Right? There's questions about love. There's questions about loss. There's questions about pain, hope, redemption, sorrow. There's questions about uncertainty. So think about those powerful moments in your life where you really didn't know what the right thing to do was. Think about that moment in your life of unbridled joy. Think about the time you yeah, lost something. And just write it down. One sentence, okay? You don't have to judge yourself. Don't censor yourself. Just write it without judgment. Put it away. Come back to it a day later. Write it again. Try and fill the page. What I'm starting to give you here by getting involved in this is a whole bunch of powerful experiences you have that are instant stories. Just add water and boom, instant table topic, right? And if you organize them by category with a little bit of practice, which I'll show you how to do, very quickly what you can do is you can go, okay, oh, that's the underlying question I heard. Which one of my personal narratives fits? I've had questions, what would you do if you found $10,000? Well, that's a question of hope or second chances, right? Or a question of opportunity. Well, I've got things in my life that are about opportunity or second chances or hope. I could take one of those personal narratives and put it into this question and just answer it in terms of $10,000. So personal narratives are one of the best devices ever, right? And you've got stories to tell. Everybody has a story to tell. Powerful stories. You may think your life's not interesting. You are so wrong. 
your life is interesting because only you have experienced it. You've got something to share, but you do need to dig. It's like sifting for gold, and those nuggets are there, but you've got to put in the work without judging yourself and just write them out. You don't even have to know what they mean yet. We'll get to that in a minute. But those little thoughts, those little moments in time that were powerful for you, those are your personal narratives. And by the way, this makes an amazing uh, speech file. If you ever need an idea, you go to your personal narrative sheet, you will never want for a speech idea again as long as you live. So we've got personal narratives. Now, once you've got your personal narrative, well, let's just back it up. You walk up here, they give you the question, you shake hands, you're ready to go. You stop and compose yourself, you enjoy the silence, maybe do the end dates there, right? You listen for the underlying question and you match it up to a personal narrative. Now, this is what one of the three things that separates the people who just kill it from the people who also got up here and shared the stage. Great stories have a purpose, okay? Because we don't deliver speeches. I don't care if it's table topics or regular speeches. Get out of your head the idea that you deliver speeches because you do not. What you deliver is messages, okay? You deliver a message. People who get up to speak without having a message are taking valuable oxygen. They're nice people, I love them, they'll still get hugs and I'll drive them to the airport. But, <laughs> but they're not doing their job as a speaker, okay? You're here to deliver messages that change how people see, feel, and think. And when you make that shift, if you haven't already in your speaking career, you will find that your audiences love you and lean in to get that next word. So know your message. So once you've got all your personal narratives written down, after a couple days, you'll kind of let them ferment, like a beer or age like a good wine. Come back, maybe with a friend, maybe by yourself. Ask, what does it mean? Try and find the meaning of that narrative in one sentence. Ten words or less, don't cheat, I'll be checking. Okay, so if you can do that, so let me give you an example here. One of my personal narratives is about the time my adoption fell through, right? And I had to really stop and think, I know this is important to me, but what does it mean? Well, I realized at the end of the day, the reason I hold on to that story and I share it with my friends and the people I care about is because there's a message there that families fo are formed in different ways in their own time. And that's the message that I want to share. So if I've got my personal narrative and I know the message I want you to take away, do you think I can funnel my entire speech with almost no effort into a powerful ending? Yeah. I was at a division contest with two speakers I respect immensely. Both asked the same question in table topics. One gave a really intelligent analytical answer. The other one told a heartfelt story that ended with a message. Everything else was a wash, total net wasn't even close. The person who had a message, who bared part of their soul a little bit, told people about their hopes, their fears, their worries, their concerns, boom. Because people aren't here to hear, they're not in the audience to hear you solve the Rubik's Cube of what a table topics question answer is. Oh, I've come up with the best equation. See, I've got it solved. That's not what it's about. It's about connecting with people. So reveal a bit of yourself. Give them a little bit of you to take away, right? And personal narratives make that really easy to do because these are topics that are important to you. So end with a message. And if you know what your message is before you start, it's easy. And give something of yourself. Now this gentleman right here, we were talking in the hallway and he also came up with a great point. So I got to give credit where credit is due. Now, we were talking about, weren't we? Yes? Oh, about, <laughs> I hope it was you, uh, about when, when you're up here, have some energy. Like, do, no, who was I? Raise your hand. Who was I talking to? About when you're doing a table topics question. Oh, there we are. I'm so sorry. I attributed the wrong source. Uh, when you're up here, put some of your, your vitality into it. Why would anyone else get excited at your answer if you're not excited about it yourself, right? So audiences love people who love them. So show them your love, give a piece of yourself, get excited. And, and audiences are amazing at meeting you halfway. Whatever you put out, they're gonna give back and more. So take a risk that way, okay? Be emotionally vulnerable, show some energy, show some passion, and, and you're gonna get big dividends. Now, once you've done all this, you're almost there, you're almost home, okay? You're doing great. And this is the one technique that 
It's sophisticated. Politicians have been using it for years to pull the wool over your eyes. It's what I call the weave. Okay. Have you ever heard a politician on the news get asked the question, where did the million dollars go? Well, that is a great question. A million dollars is a large amount of money, and you know, we need more money because money is important. And a million dollars would buy a lot of things. And that's why I'm very concerned about this million dollars. <laughs> did they talk about the million dollars? Sure. Did they answer the question of where it went? No. <laughs> that's the weave. Politicians say, answer the question you wished that the interviewer had asked you. We want to be a little more subtle than that because if you do that in a contest, your judges, who are very smart people and who are paying attention, will realize you did not actually answer the question and they will ding you. Okay, and our goal is crushing table topics. We're not here to have just gotten through it, we're here to win it. So you want to answer the question. But a weave works something like this. Here's the question they asked you over here and here is your personal narrative. Okay? So what you do is when you start, you've got your idea, you know where you want to go? Restate the question. What a great question about where did the million dollars go? Now, jump back to your personal narrative. When I was a young man and didn't have a penny to my name, I would have killed for a million dollars. Jump back to the question. You know, seeking a million dollars, there's a lot of places it could disappear to. Jump back to your personal narrative. Just touch, touch. Tell your personal narrative, but periodically touch the question and rephrase it exactly, okay? If you do that, if you weave back and forth, you're spending more of your time in your personal narrative, but if you touch the question and weave back, you create a seamless hole. You pull the two together, and you really can't see where one ends and the other begins, all right? That's the weave. Now, raise your hand if you think, okay, that was an insane amount of things you're asking me to do with only 15 seconds to prepare. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, well, you're all, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And you know what, you're absolutely right. And, and let me be totally honest here. I didn't start off using that, this technique as this complete technique. I started using it as pieces, and then I saw people smarter than myself who I watched and admired and would seek out again and go, how do they tackle questions? And I'd find something they did, I thought, that makes sense. I wonder if I can marry it with another idea. So the way you learn table topics is the way you learn to juggle. All right? What I'm asking you to do is to get on a unicycle with a chainsaw and a couple flaming torches and get going. All right? And it won't end badly at all. Okay? <laughs> but but I, I didn't learn to juggle that way. I learned with two rolled up socks. You pick one technique and you get comfortable with it. So what's a technique you heard tonight that you think, you know what, I could step six inches outside of my comfort zone and try that one technique. You know what, I could later on tonight with a cup of tea write out some of my personal narratives. I could write down a few sentences about ideas in my life. I could stand here for 10 seconds, even if I know what I'm going to say, and just get comfortable with the discomfort of silence. These are the things you try. You fold one into your repertoire, you get comfortable with it, then you add another sock to your juggling repertoire. And before you know it, you will be absolutely crushing table topics. Now, I, I made a promise here that you could get all this on PDF. So if you want, if you, if you trust me with your email address, you can leave it there. You will get my, uh, my table topics, strategies, everything. You'll get a list of hundreds of table topics questions that I use to practice. I practice table topics questions. I do two or three in the morning with coffee, random ones, and I go, okay. <laughs> How would I use this technique? It's, it works, it works. You, you get the question and you go, okay, what's the underlying story? What, what, what's the universal underlying story? Which one of my personal narratives would I marry to this, right? You practice thinking about it in a safe environment. That's what we do at Toastmasters. So I practice doing that with my coffee in the morning. It takes five minutes, but you get good really quick. <laughs> so I want you to try that. And if you'd like to, the whole thing is there. I will send it to you in PDF. And by the way, if you are giving me your email address, I will also email you. I got a little special event going on. Some of you may know Darren LaCroix, 2001 world champion. I've been bugging him and he's agreed to come on and do a webinar with me. He's gonna talk for about 40 minutes on what it takes to take your speaking to that level. He's gonna talk about his journey, how he used Toastmasters, the difference between maybe how I approached and how he approached it, and 
the role of mentors and just a few really specific things about how to learn in this environment. So that's free to all my friends. So if you send me your email address, I will make sure that you get on that list and you can hang out with Darren in your bunny slippers if you want to. All right. Thank you so much for your time.